Happy Saturday morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Collider Mailbag. I'm your host, John Roca, and I am really excited to welcome to the show for the first time someone I've been on Movie Talk uh, with a few times, someone I met way ages ago on a junket or on a, what, where were we, a Netflix thing? No, no, a Pixar thing. It was mm-hmm. the Pixar yeah. thing. Uh, we met there and, and got to know each other back when I was just kind of new and getting into the business, and I was a rookie, and you guys were these veterans, and it was so much fun to get to know you, and that is Silas Lesnick. How are you, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on, man. How's been your time coming on Movie Talk? Have you enjoyed Movie Talk? I've been, I've had such a blast. Yeah. And like the people that watch are so friendly. Like yeah. to get responses on Twitter and to realize like, oh, there's this giant community of people that just love the same things is <laughs> really cool. <laughs> and you do work for Cinema Blend. As, oh, what, what do you do work for oh, now? I, I work at a movie bill, movie which bill. is, uh, yeah. we, we are a, we used to be a publication. Now we're sort of an augmented reality mm-hmm. app. Uh, we're in the Regal Cinemas app. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a cool frozen activation this week. Yeah, you guys should go check that out, a uh, frozen activation. And also, if some of you are Avengers Endgame fans, you should read his explanation of the time jumping stuff that happened. That's still an article I go back and read every once in a while to kind of get my head still around. Because I'm not a science oh, guy. Oh, thank you. I'm not a science guy, Les Silas, but you were able to explain it in a way that I got. So oh, thank it was you. Like, yeah, it was good I, stuff. I just love drawing timelines. <laughs> <laughs> if I could take any franchise and just figure out the timeline of it, that's my favorite that's thing. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, well, you know how this works. We get questions from you all uh and then we pick we pick them out and talk about them uh, if you want your question to be possibly in contention to be on a, a collider uh, mailbag episode what you need to do is when we put the calls out every week usually around tuesday on instagram and on twitter make sure you put that hashtag collider mailbag on your responses because it makes it easier for me to find and put into the pile or you can also email us at mailbag at collider.com i pick out a bunch of them send them off to silas silas picked out five he really wants to talk about so we're going to get into it you ready yeah all right let's do it our first uh, uh, question it's from twitter at nathan noir asks what are your thoughts on the elizabeth Banks situation it seems as though she blamed her movie's low box office on the fact that men don't want to see women in a leading role do you agree or do you think there was another reason for its failure Silas? so one of the reasons i picked this question mm. is because i saw elizabeth banks's comments yes. and i had sort of this reaction of like that seems really unpleasant mm-hmm. like however uh what i learned is the comments were made during the junket. Yeah. They just ran after the movie came out. So she is not specifically talking about the failure of the movie, but the way the article ran, it certainly has some negative connotations, which is not her fault in the slightest. Mm -hmm. Um, I I like Charlie's Angels. I didn't, I wasn't blown away by it, uh, but it's certainly not her fault as Mm -hmm. a director. I, I, I think it was a very well made movie. Uh, there's things I wish had done better, but there's certain sequences in it that I thought were pretty exceptional. Yeah. Uh, and it's a bummer that it did so bad. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's more the brand mm-hmm. than anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I also think, look, uh, uh, the way you presented is correct. They were taken out of context in answers to junket questions before we knew how the movie did. She did tweet about it. She certainly said if something's going to flop, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad my name is on it four times, kind of a jokey type of thing. Uh, so, okay, great, cool. Um, but I also think, you know, uh, she wants to push this narrative, uh, and she certainly has a cause that she is fighting for, and that is to have more women, uh, leading films, leading action films, more women behind the camera. And so why not? She has this thing that she wants to push. There's nothing wrong with that. We've seen it happen in film all the time. Oscar So White campaign certainly did that by trying to make the, the Academy more diverse and it's working. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes it may not be comfortable. It may not be correct. The messenger may not even be stating it fully correctly or may stumble around, but the overall gist of it is what, or the genesis of it is what should have some kind of merit in people's eyes. Now, uh, Charles Angels, you're right. Didn't do well. I think there's a number of reasons why it didn't do well. Marketing. I think the cast isn't a cast that you'd be like, oh, I got to go see this cast. Uh, I, it's not a mainstream cast necessarily other than maybe Kristen Stewart um, and also I think maybe people weren't clamoring for another one and that's an organic thing how can you know that until you put something out and see people's reaction to it so I think in some ways too it was kind of unfortunate the way the movie was was presented to critics mm. um, th- th- there's that whole imaginary thing on Twitter where it's like Disney pays critics and no, it's yeah, like, yeah. no, but the reason you think that is because Disney treats critics very well. Yes. They, they show their movies early. There's time to get things done. And what Disney does is they allow Twitter reactions. Right. And the fact of the matter is, 
even if a movie's bad, the Twitter reactions by and large are going to be good for any movie because most people don't want to go on Twitter and yeah. trash a film. Yeah. Um, I, I personally, if I hate a movie, I'm not going to say anything bad about it, even if I'm allowed to. Mm -hmm. But if I love a movie, I'm happy to champion it. And it's a shame that they didn't realize that with Charlie's Angels. Yeah. Had they done screenings two or three weeks before it came out, allowed Twitter reactions only, we would have seen a lot of buzz of people saying, that was really fun. And if somebody didn't really like it, there's a chance they'll be like, oh, it wasn't for me. Right. But the vast majority of reactions are going to be positive. Yeah, look at Venom. A massive, <laughs> yeah, Venom. I mean, a lot of people were like not positive about Venom critics wise, but the fan reaction, the Twitter reaction was so positive that helped to get people to go back and see it multiple times or to go for the first time mm -hmm. to see it even. So you make a great point, Silas. And I think that's a big, big thing that no one seems to be stressing hard is that I think the studio didn't believe in the film. That's my personal feeling. Judging from the marketing, judging from what you said, not doing the screenings early enough, not letting people build up the buzz enough, not going a month out and showing screenings, doing like the week before, those kinds of things are markers subconsciously for fans uh, that films aren't really supported by the studio, certain films. And it's not like Star Wars. Star Wars is done, is held because they don't want that stuff getting out there, any of the plot points or whatever. But Charlie's Angels is a different situation. And I think if you'd built up the buzz over and over and over again, boom, and drop the film, then you would have gotten a lot better reaction overall from the fans. So that makes sense. I kind of miss the the like commercialism tie-ins of my youth too. <laughs> oh, like, yeah, there would have been a, should have been a crap ton for this. I want to go to McDonald's and get like collectible glasses with <laughs> yeah. each of the angels on it. <laughs> that's, the, that's how you do it. That's exactly how you do it. So it just felt to me like they had hired her. There were maybe some stuff going on behind the scenes. And then by the end, the studio maybe wasn't hundred percent behind it. Cause it didn't feel like they were supporting this movie the way they would support another action franchise. So yeah. And it, it, it's so weird too, coming after Aladdin. I mean, particularly yeah, Naomi Scott points. feels like just that is something to double down on yeah. and say like, hey, we've got this new star that you already like. Right, right, yeah, good point. Uh, all right, let's move on to our next uh, email. Uh, it's from Vincent Arcio. He writes, uh, hey, oh, what's up guys? I'm so happy that they're going to plan on continuing Arthur Fleck's journey as the Joker. I'm eager to see how he even becomes more of a mastermind criminal, which was something that was missing from the first film. Todd Phillips' take on Joker was heavily inspired by 70s cinema, but specifically Scorsese's style. My question is, would it be better yeah, if he maintained this style and maybe approached another 70s director's filmmaking style, like a Brian De Palma or Francis Ford Coppola, thanks for the content and always remember to put on a happy face. Yeah, all right. Anyway, tell us, uh, Saz, what do you think? Should he continue in the Scorsese style or change his style or should he just look for something else? What do you think he'll do? I, I definitely hope the style changes mm -hmm. uh, just because I think that is really fun. Mm -hmm. I almost hope it's not the 70s, though. I hope they look... At the 80s. Yeah. And, I mean, technically the movie is 85. Yeah, but 85, it takes place. but it's shot like a 70s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But vibe, yeah. continue to move through the decades <laughs> would be awesome. And you kind of have a built-in continuity doesn't matter so much. Yeah, so yeah. there's something kind of cool about like, wait, why is it 10 years later and he hasn't aged 10 years? Um, oh, right. And just keep reinventing him. I think that works because the Joker's always been timeless, mm -hmm. right? The Joker, like Batman in the comics has never aged unless Dark Knight, unless you count Dark Knight Returns, but the Joker is always timeless, right? So why, it would be fun to see uh, 10 years later, a 1980s Joker who hasn't aged at all. Then you add that kind of super supernatural element to the Joker, that he always finds a way to live, never can die. And even in Dark Knight Returns, he has to kill himself in order to die. Batman still can't do it. So uh, why, how could this guy be able to go toe to toe with this master fighter all the time, the Joker? So how do you do that? You add a supernatural element to him. Maybe that is it, like he, every year. And so it's like a subtle thing. Uh, but as far as styles, I think Todd Phillips just does his own style. He'll do his own thing if this sequel happens. What, mm -hmm. did, what did you think about all that stuff with the sources and- It's weird. THR it's it's weird deadline? to have THR have a story with as many sort of facts as yeah. it did and just say, oh no, that's absolutely not true. Right, like debunked like, well, a little bit. Where did this come from? Right, like, that's right. odd. And I also think like, of course we're gonna get a Joker movie. <laughs> there, there, is, there is evidence that both Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix kind of want a Joker movie. Right. The movie made more than a billion dollars Fans want to see it. Yeah. The only thing to decide is is how you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And who's going to come back? And if if it's going to be a criminal mastermind thing, which I think would be great, I'd love to see a Joker criminal mastermind situation. You know, Todd Phillips came out and said, you know, the Joker that's going to hassle the Batman 
uh, maybe was inspired by Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. But if we make that 10-year jump, any, any, everything's in play. Because remember, it's in 86, then it would jump to 96. And there have been rumors that the Batman is supposed to occur in the 90s. So then you'd have Joaquin Phoenix be a part of it. But if you do, but if you said in 86, also Wonder Woman, isn't she? Is Wonder Woman yeah, 84? Yeah, So Wonder Woman maybe knows about the Joker as well. So all of this can now start coming into play. I would also say my personal theory on Wonder Woman is yeah. that we're going to see a Justice Society introduced. Oh, really? I mean, Wonder Woman was one of the founding members of Justice Society. Justice League didn't quite catch on. Yeah. But maybe in the 80s, there was a Justice Society. Who's in Justice Society? Power Girl? Right. Uh, you know, it's Wildcats? changed a bunch. And there's versions of characters that don't quite like there's a green lantern but it's it's the alan oh, right. scott yeah, green yeah, lantern with the, with the, yeah, yeah and with there's the a collar. flash but it's the jay garrick yeah flash. yeah the jay garrick flash would be awesome but yeah. even actually in the in the jsa comics later on they had the kingdom comes superman yes join which yes. is like that would be cool to see oh, you just made my mind explode <laughs> anyway all right do you want to jump in and read the next one yeah oh, absolutely yeah. Uh, Batman well 1987 writes what I find interesting about WB is they tend to remedy or fix things for the people they work with and their fans over time that episode from Batman 66 that was to feature Clint Eastwood as Two-Face that never got made released it during the Batman 66 comic run Billy D. Williams never got to play Two-Face cast him as Two-Face in the Lego Batman movie Nick Cage didn't get to play Superman cast him in that part and Teen Titans go to the movies Richard Donner didn't like what Richard Lester did to his movie let him make his own cut with the footage he shot <laughs> with the fact that it's well known Known that Snyder was essentially fired after a personal family tragedy uh, and that a lot of people didn't like Whedon's cut and have an interest to see what Snyder had envisioned, do you think it would have been a matter of time before WB gave the go-ahead of a Snyder cut, but with the hashtag release the Snyder cut trending, will it happen sooner rather than later? Or do you think that there wasn't any support from the Justice League actors that the Snyder footage would have remained buried? <laughs> Oh yeah, if there wasn't any support from the Justice League actors, I don't think we would ever seen this film uh, or the possibility of this film. No, uh, I think a, a director clamoring for his version of a film happens all the time in Hollywood. If the, but it's rare when the actors get behind it, and it's rare when the fans get behind that possibility and create a movement by billboards and and what have you, and be a constant uh, uh, voice in the discussion for this and the dialogue for this. So to me, that's that's the thing that I come back to is this is an incredible amount of factors coming together to make this a possibility but you make a lot of great points here with this uh, batman well this idea ability it, them like making it right with it. wb does eventually make it right with everybody and certainly if people are in the regime now who are not there when snyder was there maybe they don't think it's a negative to release this thing on hbo max like a lot of people are predicting uh, a version of it on hbo max to launch the service and then everybody can see it and we can all move on. <laughs> and Zach can say, yep, that's my version of the film, like it or hate it, that's my version of the film. And we can all move on from it and not create conspiracy theories anymore. And the actors themselves maybe can stop being hassled about it too or asked about it too and can finally see their work within the construct of the film that they wanted to be a part of. The, the trouble I have, mm. and I, I, I know there's a lot of back and forth on this, so it's kind of dangerous to say mm. anything about the Snyder Cut. Sure. It doesn't make sense okay. that there is a version of the movie <laughs> that is capable of being edited into a movie that's really, really good. Warner Brothers did not take a movie that was really, really good yeah. and say, no, you're fired. We're going to have somebody else come in and we're going to release something that really is garbage. Yeah. Like they just wouldn't do that. There's a possibility in my mind that the Snyder Cut could use animation. Uh, oh, uh, interesting. I, I think Warner Brothers has done okay. some really great stuff with DC Comics and animation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, despite uh, Jason Momoa saying that he's seen it, I, I cannot believe that there is a finished cut out there. I can imagine, I mean, even, even the Donner cut that's yeah. mentioned in the question, it's not perfect. It, it doesn't have the ending it's supposed to have. Right. It has the ending from the Richard Lester version because like, it, it doesn't fit as well as it should. Yeah. With animation, which is something that, that Zack Snyder has even worked with before, yeah, like true. both Guardians of Gahul yeah. and incorporating the Black Freighter stuff into the Watchmen right. ultimate cut, uh, that would be a really cool way yeah. to see. But for instance, it, Steppenwolf, there's, there's, it's not like they went ahead and finished the visual effects yeah, for man. a character for footage that they didn't use. Yeah, uh, and even if it was there, I would suspect the cost would be tremendous. Yeah. To, to try to do that. 
Yeah, well, I think Kevin Smith, didn't he come out and say it will just take another 20 to 30 for them to finish it and that it's almost done? Mm -hmm. So, but would these, would would there be reshoots, Silas? That's the other thing. Because I'm cool if you drop a hashtag on your Instagram or on your Twitter, but to me, it's like not up or shut up. Because if you put that hashtag in and you support the release of the film and you're an actor in that movie, a prominent actor in that movie, then if there's reshoots, you need to put your money where your mouth is. If you want to release it, the way to release it is to have you come back and do reshoots, get into that Wonder Woman costume get into the superman costume get into the cyborg stuff flash stuff and then do those scenes so that the film feels seamless but then there's also the sense of like oh is it just a big bluff because we can look at ben affleck right. and say oh well he was terrible in that movie and be like oh but if only you could see the snyder cut because that's <laughs> the best batman performance ever that's a good point the narrative of it all and then the second they go yeah we're gonna release it wait 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 wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't mean what i said anyway we'll see i think i think you make great points here bat manuel the fact that wb does have a history of kind of making things right in the long run which is rare for a studio so there is possibilities here but i i just i think i'm with silas the I wonder how much of it is really finished and I wonder how much of effort it would take to finish it and if people would be willing to put in the effort both in front and behind the camera to make that happen fully and maybe it is animation maybe it is like those uh, draw the storyboards and we see there and voiced over we'll see I don't know I, I, I do think though that that what DC has sort of like accidentally landed on mm -hmm. uh, it, there was a time where people were like, oh, well, Marvel Studios is the way to do it. You build up a universe and you have this shared continuity. Yeah, yeah. But uh, like we're moving into the crisis on infinite Earths in the CW shows. Right. And I am i haven't even really been following the CW shows in a little while, but I am really excited yeah. for Crisis on Infinite Earths. Oh, yeah. For so many reasons. And like, frankly, it's like I, that's what I want Marvel to do now. Yeah. I, I, I want to like you own all the Fox properties, do a giant parallel universe crossover with the whole history of everything. Yeah. That could work. Well, that's a lot of a lot of people have you involved for that, but I absolutely agree. Do you want to read our next one? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, a, John Roca, an awesome guest. That's me. It's an email from <laughs> Perez Daniel. Yeah. Oh, Perez Daniel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've noticed that some actors and actresses have done multiple films with one studio over others. For instance, Patrick Wilson is contracted to be in at least one more Conjuring film and could come back as Ocean Master in Aquaman two. Are we making a return to the age of contract stars that we can consider being in talks when a studio is marking casting calls? Thanks for taking my question. Mm. What do you I, think? I think that yes and no. I think it's it's a simpler mm -hmm. uh, solution necessarily than than the age of contracts. Uh, actors enjoy working with people that they've worked with before, and it, it's sort of just like going to a restaurant. Yeah. You like uh, there are sides of Hollywood that are not great. Mm -hmm. There are people that are angling only for dollars. There are all sorts of, all sorts of things. So yeah. when you've worked at a studio where you know that you can trust them, that, that you know how they're gonna market a movie, um, you tend to gravitate back towards that same place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like an evolution of it, right? We had the contract stars and, and what you're talking about for maybe the, some of you who might not know this, but back in the, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, I think, up until the 60s, just before the 60s, uh, studios would pick out an actor or would sign actors to contracts and they would pay for their acting, they would pay for their uh, um, grooming, they would pay for their dance lessons. Dan uh, you know, some of them, uh, some of the female actresses went to charm school. Some of the male actresses got, tr male actors got trained in uh, weapons and fighting and stage combat. So they put it, they essentially invested in them as a property, but they were signed to only do movies for them. And this is back when studios were doing like 25, 30, 40, 50 films a year because they were so quick to turn around. So they were signed to there and they couldn't go and do movies for another studio. They, that actor had to stay in that studio. I think what we're seeing now is that both studios and actors are creating relationships that they want to come back and work together. An actor will come back to a studio multiple times if he, he or she feels, A, they take care of them, B, they provide them with good material, and C, they support them when they put their films out in a positive way or defend them with their PR department from a bomb. And so those are those things that you develop. So I think it's more a matter of free will, both the studio free will reaching out to these actors or actresses to come on to their projects, and then actors and actresses of free will choosing to come back because they feel taken care of by these studios. It's also interesting just to hear how studios deal with different people. Mm. Um, and one of the ones I always think about is Pixar, where you hear like, really, if you're an actor in a Pixar movie, you're probably making less than you would be making as a voice in another movie. Right. But 
they treat you really well and yeah. they treat you like you're part of this family. And I, I think it's one of those re reasons you look at like um, Onward and mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well, Chris Pratt and uh, uh, Tom Holland, yeah. they're very, very close to Disney already. Um, I, I think even Chris Pratt, you know, he was sort of like in the delivery man right before they announced That's true. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was laying this groundwork and kind of yeah, putting in his time so that, you know, in a way they would take care of him da later down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. So certainly not the contract stuff coming back, but I think it's more a matter of like both people entering into this understanding about working together uh, going forward. All right, our last question is an email from Lassa J. Nordvik. He writes, greetings, Roka and honored guest. Well, wow. With de-aging being the hot new cinema technology, who would you most like to see youthified for a movie outing? I would love to see Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford team up for a movie that takes place just after The Return of the Jedi with Luke setting out on an adventure to rebuild the Jedi Order and Han there to pilot him around and help him out. It could be a great story of a friendship growing stronger and deeper than Han. Oh, sorry, deeper. And Han, somewhat reluctantly, I suspect, learning to believe in the Jedi myth. It's a great idea. It sounds awesome. Um, I would go see that movie. I yeah. will say I don't think that the the youthifying is there. Yeah, I think that it works really, really well for segments of movies mm -hmm. and like the opening of of the Ant Man films. Like it looks amazing. Right. But even some of the best there is just looks. I was just rewatching Rogue One, and I still oh, yeah. like. You know, Tarkin and Leia don't look perfect. You know it's a CGI face, right. and it looks amazing. I, it blows me away that they're able to do that, uh, and I think it works in little bursts. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think I would be like I. I just can't imagine watching a full movie with Luke and Han de-aged with Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford. Right. Well, I mean, having seen The Irishman, here's the thing with de-age, and of course, Ant Man as well. The problem with de-aging is you can de-age the face, you can't de-age the body, and by that I mean the actor. The actor moves slow. Like, in, there's a scene in Irishman where, uh, and this is not a spoiler, but Robert De Niro does what Robert De Niro does in these uh, Scorsese films. He's kicking the crap out of somebody, and he looks like an old man kicking the crap out of somebody, mm. even though facially he looks like in his, he's in his 30s or early 40s. Physically, he looks like a man in his 60s or 70s. He's literally going like... <clears throat> And you're just like, there's no way this is hurting. There's no way this looks, but you forgive it because the overall film is fantastic. And the same thing with uh, Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer. They physically moved like older people, even though their face was younger. So that's one of the things that's a negative, I think, about the de-aging. De-age the face all you want. If the body doesn't move and flow with a matching of the age of the face, then it's not believable 100%. I get you on, I, I think the Tarkin thing works better on 4K. Mm -hmm. uh, and strangely enough, uh, but the Leia thing, I don't think they put as much time into Leia as they put into Tarkin. So that, that bears out. But look at Gemini, man. We saw that version of a younger Will Smith. It still didn't feel right. It still felt like the Uncanny Valley type thing. So it was like, weird. Yeah, for most of the movie, I thought Gemini Man looked spectacular. Yeah. And then the final scene yeah, the, the is full just young awful. Will Smith. Yeah. Like, and I don't know why. Mm hmm. Yeah, and so you got, well, okay, can we de-age? I don't think we're at that technology yet where the de-aging would be seamless and believable. We'd have to be talking ourselves into it through nostalgia to want to see uh, Han and Luke on an adventure. I think I'd love, I'd love to see that, but I, I don't know if people would look past it enough. I kind of am, am leaning towards just recasting. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I know there's a lot of people championing like Sebastian Stan mm -hmm. uh, as Luke. That would be cool. I, yeah. I would love to see a Luke Skywalker movie that just is set in the middle of a continuity we've already seen. Mm -hmm. Make a Shadows of the Empire movie. That's certainly possible, absolutely. And fill in the holes or the gaps in time when all this was happening after Jedi to lead him into the grumpy old man there in, in The Last Jedi instead of Return of the Jedi. Um, all right, well, there you go. We'll see what happens as it goes along. Certainly, uh, technology is catching up quickly and all things we see now, five years ago, we couldn't have even thought of happening. So who knows, five years from now, if maybe they've corrected this and we'll see with the James Dean situation, how that turns out. Maybe they've corrected all of this and, and make it work. We'll see. Uh, Silas, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for, for having me. This is really fun. Man. Yeah, it was a blast. Uh, where can people find you and everything you do? Oh, uh, MovieBill, moviebill.com. Uh, I run the editorial side of the website, but then 
then uh, Real Cinema's app, we have mm -hmm. some cool uh, 3D stuff that you can summon with the app. Uh, <laughs> and, and if they want to follow you on social media, it's at- Oh, it's at Silas Lesnick, which of course everyone knows how to spell. <laughs> no, it's probably on the screen. <laughs> I hope it's on the screen. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, you can follow me at The Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Shout out to Adam Smith there for switching in the booth. And shout out to all of you for sending in your wonderful questions that we got to answer here on the show. Once again, as I said at the beginning of the show, if you want to send in your question for consideration, when we put the calls out on social media, on Twitter and on Instagram, put that hashtag Collider Mailbag on it. It makes it easier for me to find when I do a search for those and put them into the pile to be considered to be on the show. Or you can email us at mailbag at collider.com. All right, that's it for us. Have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget tomorrow, Ace Cabrera, one of the new co-hosts of Collider Jedi Council, is stopping by to be my guest for his first episode of Collider Mailbag. Have a great Saturday. Until then.